Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Men of Valor podcast. We're privileged to have you joining with us, whether you're from the States, here local where I'm from, or you're from around the world in another country. We are uh, so blessed to have men and, and sometimes spouses and children uh, will tune in and catch it as well. But primarily, uh, we are a ministry geared towards men, and we are blessed to have men all over this planet. Uh, just tune in and uh, hear what God's put on our hearts and to hear some topics that we feel like men need to talk about. And uh, we're just honored that you're with us. We do have a couple brief announcements. We'll get into those at the very end of the podcast. Uh, I am blessed as one of the executives here uh, to not only be able to host the podcast, but also to, to pick my own guest tonight. I have two very, very dear friends, two great guys. I'm going to introduce them to you right after the break. Um, so this month, talking about health, uh, the well-being of a man, the totality of a man. We've looked at uh, caring for the health of a man's soul. That was week one. I did that with uh, special guest Philip Pigeon. And then, of course, we've, we've looked at physical health. Uh, I would encourage you to check out that episode if you haven't caught it yet uh, with Eric and his special guest. Last week, uh, Jordan and I got into the whole concept of having a plan in the importance of rest, a couple areas not talked about. And then today we're going to cover our final topic for the month uh, on this area of health, and that's going to be the area of mental health, uh, something we don't talk a lot about as men. Probably the others can be a little bit easier. Physical health certainly is easier to talk about. Uh, but nonetheless, mental health is right up there as being extremely important, I feel like. So we're going to do that. So not taking any more time. Thank you again for joining us, and let's go ahead and get after it. This is the Men of Valor podcast. We exist to help men grow as disciples of Jesus. Welcome to season two. We're glad you're here. Let me tell you, I once was a sinner, but I am no longer a sinner. I am a saint. I am a son of the living God most high. Go home. Embrace your wife with no expectations and tell her that you love her and ask her how can I lead you tell me what you need be transparent be open be honest but if we arm ourselves and we never use what we have that's useless hey guys thank you so much for listening here are your hosts Travis Watson, Eric Stewart, Jordan Loggins, and Randall Ballou. Let's get after it. All right, gentlemen, and welcome back. Again, I cannot thank you enough for listening. We are just humbled and honored by the, the many people that that God's allowed this, this po podcast to touch. We are truly, uh, truly amazed in our ministry, uh, what God has done with it. Uh, we've seen salvations. We've seen marriages restored. We've seen men break free from from sin and bad habits, and we've seen men build brotherhood, relationships. It's just been incredible, and uh, I want to encourage you, if you don't have a group of men in your local church, which is first and foremost, um, look online digitally. Uh, we're blessed to, to provide that to you, but also to be partnered with some other amazing ministries where you can find brotherhood and uh, just remind you, as always, you're not meant to walk alone not meant to walk alone. And certainly the area we're talking about tonight, mental health, definitely an area you don't want to walk alone in. And I mentioned in the start at the uh, the head tonight that I have two very special friends, two dear guests, also happen to be two pastors at the church where my bride and I attend. And I've known these guys for, gosh, close to, I think it's been close to about 10 years total uh, that we have known one another in some format or another. Uh, but Mr., I shouldn't say Mr., you deserve the title, Pastor, Reverend, Supreme Pontiff, uh, Chief Honcho, uh, any other titles I can come up with? No. Uh, Nathan Beer, who is over uh, discipleship at Hope Fellowship, and also Mr. Matthew Cogswell, who is over um, the, no, you're over discipleship, Matthew. Yeah, That's I'm right. I got it backwards. <laughs> and Nathan is over college. Nathan College, Sorry. Matthew Discipleship. And, and I say that as part of their, their intro, partly because they've won, worn, blah, worn many ministry hats in ministry, and they've got a lot of different experiences to draw on, and uh, both with, with younger people, older people, uh, filling in, uh, teaching the Word of God, associate pastor type ministry. 
and uh, just blessed, blessed to know these guys. They've ministered to my family in a lot of different ways over the years. So guys, welcome. Nathan, I know you've been a little under the weather, some stuff going on at the home, but thank you for making time. It's great to have you with us tonight. Thanks for being here, man. Of course. Thanks for having me. Honored to, to get to come on and just have this conversation. I like how you've made sure to say that we're not experts or anything like that, because that's probably a very important <laughs> issue. We're probably more experts on what not to do than anything else. We want people to know that certainly none of us here and the executives try and remind everyone all the time. I, I hate even kind of using that title, the executives of the ministry, because it makes us sound really important. We're really <laughs> just four country bumpkins trying not to screw up this ministry that God's left to be a part of together. <laughs> And uh, what we find is uh, through our weaknesses, much is made of Jesus, and then we get to experience some powerful things. So, uh, Matthew, I know that's your heart as well, but thanks for being here, and uh, just great to see you again, man. Again, the honor to be here, and uh, excited to have this conversation. Very, very cool. So this is episode 17 of, of season two. Can't believe we're in our second season, but... Um, I want to talk about this area of mental health with you guys and just kind of have a conversation. One of the things that's always beautiful that, that we try and do on our podcast here is not necessarily find voices that always agree or always see, see things from the same perspective, but really just to have a dialogue or a conversation about what we have either experienced, what we sense God or the Holy Spirit has taught us along the way. And uh, in this area, this topic, uh, mental health, from my opinion, is extremely important to maintain uh, your mental health, as well as the physical health, but mental health doesn't get talked a lot about in Christian circles. And one of the things I would like to do towards the end of the podcast tonight is maybe look at some of the stigma or some of the barriers that keep people from discussing mental health, from even pursuing mental health within the Christian community, the faith-based community. Uh, I think it's a real struggle because um, a lot of people just don't even know what to do with it. They don't know, is it is it okay? Is it not okay? And um, anyway, we'll get into those kind of barriers towards the end, but um, I, I think it's important because I do believe biblically this aligns with the Word of God, and that's kind of where I like to start our foundations, and whether we're talking about pornography, money, how to be a good husband, whatever it might be, there is biblical precedent, biblical principle. I mean, we go to 1 Corinthians, um, I believe it's 6, chapter 6, where Paul talks about our, our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's not just the physical aspect, but it's the totality uh, mm -hmm. of the Christian. And so stewarding one's, one's body, one's mind is extremely important. I want to just kick it off maybe with you, Matthew, and, and then we'll, we'll kick it over, Nathan, and get your perspective on the same question. But um, when you think of this area of mental health from a biblical perspective or biblical standpoint, um, what do you see as far as any specific teachings come to mind or any uh, principles that God's kind of given you over the years uh, through ministry or even through personal experience that you just say, you know what, this is why biblically I believe uh, having a sound mind is important. What do you think, Matthew? Yeah, I mean, you, you started off uh, one of those key passages uh, that for me has been grounding is that First Corinthians six nineteen. You know, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. And and as you you know said that you know, our body is, entails not just our our physical flesh, um, you know, uh, muscles, skin, you know, uh, skeletal system, all that stuff, but also our you know, our mind, our emotions, our will, intellect, um, which makes up the, the soul. And uh, and it all matters, you know, it matters to the, to the Lord, it matters to God. And I think that um, there has been uh, this kind of idea or philosophy or mindset that, um, you know, you're, you're you know, your mind is separated from your body and your body is separated from the spirit or whatnot. And that there's this kind of this disconnect. And um, yeah, I just think that it's important that we realize we're holistic beings. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And then the other passage uh, scripture that really has, I mean, there's a ton of them all throughout uh, scriptures talking about our mind and, and what we're thinking about or meditating on, but Romans 12, one and two is, is another grounding one for me. It says, you know, I beseech you there, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, or holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So yeah, I mean, all throughout scriptures, we see there is this clear focus on you know, hey, the importance of your mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I like how you frame that, that the totality of the man uh, matters to God. Um, and again, I think whether we're in this topic or other topics, too often we can compartmentalize different aspects and think, well, God cares about this part or not that part or whatnot. And we do a tremendous disservice. I mean, I grew up in the, the IFB, Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement, um, and I don't say this to bash or to make fun, but notoriously overwhelming the, no, the number of pastors that were physically out of shape. Uh, and it was almost like a badge of honor to be a big man and to be a preacher kind of thing. And it's like, no, God, God didn't give you your body so you could, you know, and I know some people struggle and it's not, like I said, the bash, but the totality of a man, not just the physical, but the mental, the internal all of that matters. And you brought up some great, great points and, and great passages as well. Romans 12, one of my faves. What about you, Nathan? Uh, anything different? I mean, Matthew got the, the softball and the easy pick of verses first, but yeah, I mean, he stole my Romans 12, to be honest. That is uh, <laughs> honestly probably about a couple of years ago, reading that and hearing a couple of teachings on that. And then just really understanding that word soma that's used there for the word body, that is mind, body, and spirit. And so it's not just your physical. And so it's the whole, you know, we're tripart beings mirroring a triune God. And there's all these things that are wrapped up in that for sure. So I think for me, that's, that's something, and maybe I'm, I'm blessed too, that I was raised in a household where mental health was talked about. My dad was a marriage and family counselor. So it was a pretty normal thing um, for us to talk about. So I don't necessarily even feel like there was a stigma around it. That was bad. Like you were talking about and um, which I feel super blessed that we were raised in a household yeah. where that was something that was shunned or, or just shoved under a rug and saved for later, but it was something where we we openly talked about and everything like that and taken very seriously as well. It was not just something trivial that we threw around, um, you know, or we would, you know, I, I remember getting scolded if we say, you know, I'm, I'm depressed, we would get scolded because they would go, no, that's, that's another level. You're <laughs> sad right now, or you're upset, but you're not depressed. And so um, one that one that I know I, I sit in a lot, there, there's two, one's a passage, and then one's a, a prayer from um, uh, the Westminster catechisms. Um, but the, uh, the Psalm one has always been one for me that I kind of take back to my mind, the sense of, you know, blessed is a man who walks out in the council of wicked, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law, he meditates day and night for he is like a tree planted next to streams of water. And so just this idea of steadfastness. And, and honestly, when you start to read scripture and you start to get the idea of like, we're to be anchored, uh, and we're not to jump from thing to thing or, or we're set our minds on things that are above Colossians three. I think there are so many texts that just talk about being planted and rooted and steadfast and firm. And for me, you know, if we were going to separate, not completely from one another, but if we were going to say, well, is that we're talking about your mind, body, or spirit for me, that always comes back to is, am I grounded? Am I steadfastness when, you know, when crap hits the fan, am, am I responding or reacting or am I already have a plan in place? And, you know, am I able to still, you know, count it all joy uh, in the midst of it because I have a rooted uh, assurance and foundation under me. So for me, Psalm 1 has always been um, something that I've leaned on. I think just when I became a Christian, that was one that I just just kind of grasped uh, and clung on to. And then Romans 12 was one that I really started to develop that theology of the soma, the mind, body, and spirit, that it's yeah. more than just, uh, I'm more than just uh, a spirit, uh, but you know, when God is making all things new and a new heaven, a new earth, my body, my physical, a physical body will be there as well. Um, and so I think for me, that's when I started to take seriously, oh, wow, you know, this is more than just I'm dead. And then my soul floats off into yeah. heaven. You know, there, there's, there's a whole being that mm. I'm currently am that Christ has saved and, and resurrected. So, Good. yeah. Good stuff. I, I love how you tied that into the Psalm one with the, the tree and planted, yeah. uh, that that word planted just has so much weight and just even yeah. hearing it hearing you recite that i also think of like psalm 139 where uh we're taught you know that god knows our thoughts at their very origin the very beginning of a concept uh he knows so 
what that speaks to us is that the internal matters tremendously right. to God. You know, I, heck, I'm not even aware half the time of the thoughts forming in my head until five minutes after I've said something that I regret kind of thing. But uh, even in Proverbs, and there's so many passages, right, about our thought life and, and as a man think it, so he becomes like there's so much there. Um, and so knowing you're grounded, knowing you're rooted, so important. Uh, I really appreciate how you guys jumped us in, in with those concepts. You know, the, the aspect of mental health matters, the stewardship we're talking about of your, your thoughts and your mind and, and being in a healthy way grounded to the one that's unshakable is important for, I think, several reasons. It helps us um, serve our communities well. Uh, certainly, it helps us fulfill you know, our responsibilities, both in ministry as well as in the home, uh, but it also helps us to live out our, our Christian values. I think of you guys, um, again, I haven't shared hardly anything about your personal lives, but, you know, both married, both with children, uh, you know, you have lives apart from the role of pastor, uh, and unlike how some people may see you and, you know, think that you live at the church 24-7. I know you're, you're, intricately connected uh, to young adults and college students and, and people throughout our community, uh, both in social ways as well as uh, in ministry ways and everything. So all of that being said, how do you as both, you can approach it even as a, a pastor or even just as a man, but how do you as an individual begin, and we'll start with you, Nathan, but how do you begin to prioritize uh, your mental well-being, if you will, on like a, a daily basis. What's what's that look like in your life? Yeah, I think I think that's still something um, that I'm working out of. What are the essentials that I need to be doing? Uh, and I think more and more I've realized what I need to be doing when I wasn't doing it. Um, so a couple of key ones that I try to do every single day, and maybe these are the most cliche things in the entire world, but I try to work out every single day uh, in some way, shape or form. I, I try to get a good workout in three or four times a week. And then the other days I'm just moving. I've really noticed um, that when I was not working out, my mental health was tanking. You know, I was just, yeah. boom, I was Eeyore, uh, just kind of walking around with a cloud over my head type thing. Um, so even sacrificing an hour and a half of sleep to go work out, I noticed, you know, a trend in the right direction. That's the second one is making sure I get enough sleep. Um, it's a big problem of mine is I like to stay up late and I like to wake up early. Um, I, I don't know many people who are both, but for some reason, God created me for a desire to be up late and wake up early. So just prioritizing getting to bed early, getting rid of those FOMO thoughts of missing out on something that I'm not going to be missing out on or shutting off the NBA game where the Celtics are probably losing or something like that. And I'm sorry, man. <laughs> uh, so sleep, working out. Um, and then uh, another really important one that I've just picked up, I kind of actually stole it from our lead pastor, Mark, um, and John Eldridge in his book, Get Your Life Back, also has this rhythm. Um, but it's just, I've just started to stop listening to podcasts and music in my free time. Um, I'll, I'll still listen to music if I'm like prepping sermons or just doing something like that. But if I'm just around the house, or especially if I'm driving now, I've just decided to sit in silence. I really started to notice that I was using those things as a means to numb myself from thoughts coming in or just to kind of escape whatever I was coming from or headed to. And not really taking that time to one, prepare, but also just settle myself. Again, we're talking about if I'm talking about my mental health or, or my mind being steadfast and rooted, I think I was thinking that that was helping me uh, in the long term uh, when it comes to, OK, I was just distracting myself. So I wasn't anxious about this thing that I was headed to or this meeting that I was going to or I wasn't you know, sitting on. Uh, I could have said that better coming from a meeting or a gathering or something like that. Uh, but honestly, I just started to feel really convicted that I was using that as an escape uh, out. And really, I was headed into those things more clouded, more reactionary rather than prepared and grounded. Mm -hmm. And so that's honestly another really big daily rhythm that I have picked up is since the new year. So relatively, relatively fresh, very fresh. Um, but just taking all those moments and not listening to podcasts or music or anything like that. And just taking that time to pray out loud if I can or just to sit in silence and let my thoughts go. Uh, I love what my dad has a great line that he says to me often, which is uh, a lot of people think about a lot of things, but not a lot of people think about what they're thinking about or think about why they're thinking about it. 
And so that's become my time to really think about why I'm thinking about the things that are on my mind. And usually it allows me, you know, by the grace of God and his Holy Spirit to reason out those things and, and kind of come to conclusions or even just ground myself more in his presence and more in his promises. So those are three. There's, there are probably a lot more if we had more time, but um, I think those are three, the third one really being a big one for me that has become one, I mean, quiet time, all, all those things, I feel like, which I'm sure Matthew can probably cover the other ones. That's good. Good stuff. What do you think, Matthew? How does, what does it look like prioritizing your, your mental well-being on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, when Nathan hit home with, uh, you know, working out, uh, getting good rest, it just seems like, oh, well, yeah, I know that's so simple or it's not it's, it's insignificant. No, it's a big deal. <laughs> it really is, you know, it's like, you know, um, as caring for our bodies, uh, you know, just you know, working out, blowing off some steam, getting the, the anxieties out by just, you know, um, you know, exercising and, you know, and, and then, you know, getting good rest, you know, not, not stay up too late, waking up, you know, uh, at a decent time. But um, also for, for me uh, personally, that's been really powerful for my mental, emotional health is uh, prioritizing Sabbath. Um, so, you know, Sabbath for, for me, um, just looking at the scriptures is, you know, that it, it entails stopping, stopping working, uh, stopping thinking about work, um, resting, um, delighting, worshiping. And so, um, so each, you know, each week, you know, I, I, I intentionally try to carve out 24 hours to, to do those things. And, and so it looks different uh, each, each week, depending on, um, you know, what that week entailed, whether if I'm, you've been doing a lot of, uh, physical labor or whatnot, then, and, you know, maybe it's, uh, just taking some time, just reading the book, uh, slowing down, resting the family, um, maybe just staying away from, uh, screen time as much as possible. So I'm not overstimulating my, my mind. Um, you know, we tend to think that, when you know we're on our phone scrolling and you know, that's resting you know but that's our minds are still working you know and they're still they're, they're still being yep. stimulated so um trying to stay you know as much as clear away from my phone and just from tv or whatever um delighting just taking time just to slow down and to delight in the simple things um not not you know being focused on uh you know uh, shopping or doing all these bunch of things but um so yeah so sabbath is practicing sabbath that uh, you know continuing to work that out as a, a family household that's a that's a challenge um in and of itself of what's a sabbath rest to me it may not be necessarily a sabbath rest for my my wife and so just kind of coordinating that with the kids two kids you had two two-year-old boy and these bananas and and the seven-year-old girl and she's got enough energy to power a football stadium so you know balancing that out with real life and um but but yeah sabbath has been a huge um practice rhythm that has helped to man just to just to slow down and yeah. to uh, allow my my mind to stink and rest you know just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to rest so yeah. yeah that's good i love it i love that you guys bring different things too it reminds me of uh, Philippians 4, uh, 8, where Paul said, you know, what's, it gives us that whole list, whatever things are true, honest, good, lovely, et cetera, you know, spend time on that kind of stuff. And uh, you both kind of alluded to good practices, but also, um, you know, pointing out that there are those negative things where we do fill our, our heads with noise and busyness and space and, and things like that. And, and that really does take a toll on our mental health. You really do have to, you know, obviously coming out of COVID, I'm sure you guys saw it even more in, in full-time ministry, but so many people just emotionally and mentally struggling, not knowing how to properly uh, rest, how to properly you know, just find enjoyment and joy in life and um, properly take care of themselves, et cetera. And, and I like what you just said too, Matthew, rest can look very different for everyone. So this is not a, please don't, don't take anything we're saying as these are the things you have to do per se, but um, you know, it, it looks different for everybody. You know, for me, 
one of the things I loved getting into, uh, and I'll, I'll quote Spurgeon on this tonight, I intend to smoke a cigar for the glory of God. I, I discovered the, the soothing aspect of uh, just good theology, a quiet space, a fire and a cigar. And just the the rest and the ease that would put me out. You guys know we've got 5 billion kids in our home and finding space to just withdraw from all of that and allow my senses to truly smell, uh, sight, taste, et cetera, just to, to unwind almost became something I really love. Uh, my wife tolerates it, but she does not love it. So anytime I'm like, hey, let's go to the, the lounge and just relax and talk tonight or something, she'll be like, I'm not going to the smoking lounge. It's not happening. Like, it's not going to happen. So, you know, and even that's not for everyone. You have to find, some people find tremendous rest and there's tremendous health benefits in running. Um, I used to run a lot more than I do now. I don't so much. I'm you know, 50 this year. And yeah, you heard it right, 50. Uh, and my knees just aren't what they used silver to be. Fog. Your I'm silver fog. Yeah. telling you. Come on. Come on, silver fog. I was fog. noticing a little more gray in that beard. I just I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> That's why I cut it shorter than it used yeah. to be. It, <laughs> it was just a glowing robe there for a while. But uh, yeah, I, I want to encourage those of you listening, make sure you do some evaluation and a and some assessment, ask yourself some questions and get with another man and ask some questions and process. Well, what does joy look like for me? What does rest, true rest look like for me? What are some things maybe someone's observed in your life that maybe are blind spots that you need to change? Like, like you guys were pointing out, you're just constantly scrolling on social media or you're staying up till 12, one o'clock in the morning because you're, you're binging shows and you love to do that and you think you're resting, but you wonder why you can't get up at six and, and have an hour with God before work or, you know, you're just fried half the day or whatever. So, you know, evaluate, talk to someone and, and do some significant uh, assessment. What about uh, some, some, maybe something we could learn here from any ministry experience you guys have had where you've had to work through a, a mental health uh, challenge with someone else, or maybe even personally, if you want to share uh, a personal mental health uh, challenge yourself had to work through. Um, Cause I know certainly through years and years of ministry, obviously there's, there's a lot of people that battle it. And obviously, again, I'm not asking you to violate anyone's confidence, but as a, a broad general example, anything come to mind as far as lessons learned from that or something you might want to pass on? Uh, Matt, we'll start with you. What do you think? Any, anything come to mind immediately? Yeah, for sure. Personally, you know, I mean, I, I grew up uh, with a mom um, who was severely mentally ill, you know, uh, for majority of my teenage life, she was, you know, curled up in a, in a ball in her room, you know, uh, whatever, you know, mental health uh, issue, you know, she had it, you know, it was agoraphobia, you know, depression, panic attacks, uh, you name it, you know, she had it, um, had you know, still, I can still remember the pill bottles in her, in her room, just the, just, you know, bottles on bottles, you know, and so growing up, I was very much, um, you know, uh, surrounded and by and, and aware of this, you know, mental health aspects. And so, um, you know, and then um, when at 20 years old, I get, uh, I come to know the Lord, have you know, born again, have this just, just encounter with the Lord. And, and, uh, and then it was uh, not too long after, um, you know, I was diagnosed with bipolar, you know, 20 years old. I'm like, what is going on? I give my life to Christ. And what, and then now all this, you know, this challenge here. And, you know, I um, proceeded and just had wilderness experience in, in, in my life. Um, you know, where I was, I was in the mental hospital for, uh, several, several times, you know, and, um, and so, uh, but even through that, um, the Lord had used so many things to draw me to him, to humble me, to, to depend on him, uh, to learn some different skill sets, um, and I don't, just being aware and having a, an, an empathy for those who struggle with mental health. You know some of the barriers I think for men in general, and just for the the stigma in um, whether it's in the, the church or whatever. There's this challenge of well, 
you know, God's supposed to, you know, he's supposed to heal your, your mind. You should have, you know, uh, you should not have any medication, right? Medication is from the devil or, you know, doctors are this and that. And, and so there's just a lot of fear. There's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of um, things. And so, so what I've had to wrestle with personally is just, man, I'm, yes, I know the Lord can heal. Uh, I know he does heal. Um, uh, and I also know that he's given wisdom to doctors and, and that there, there are good medicines, you know, that, that, that I, not everything is from the devil, right? And, and, and even though, yes, there have been, for sure, we see uh, uh, um, malicious or just inappropriate practices, doctors, psych, you know, psychiatrists all across the board, whatever, you don't throw the baby out of the bath, bath water. And so, um, so I've had to wrestle with, um, you know, taking medication as well as trusting the Lord and, um, yeah, and just being aware of the fact that um, uh, our God, my God heals and mm. he works through many different ways. Yeah, it's good. And, and it makes me uh, just, I, I, I know of several not just friends that go to therapists on a regular basis and, and Christian counselors and things like that. I've had family members, uh, numerous ones, very close ones to me uh, that have done that uh, for years due to uh, tragedy, trauma, uh, rough experiences, loss of, of loved ones young. Uh, I remember multiple funerals I've had to perform of teenagers over the years from youth ministry and stuff and, and the family left behind to deal with that, just the mental health anguish and devastation. And so uh, what I'm hearing you say, what I heard you say, and what I take away from it, and I want to encourage other people with is there is absolutely no shame in seeking help. Uh, and there's, you know, we're all broken in some way or another. And so if mental health is one of those areas where you've been diagnosed or, uh, you need medication to cope and to thrive in life or what that God has allowed us uh, through his grace and kindness, the ability to discover these things. And mm -hmm. uh, there's some, some beautiful individuals, men and women, and some beautiful uh, treatments out there to make life, uh, you know, in, in such that we can, we can function in it. And, and I like how you said too, we, we have this mentality sometimes that, well, if you're a follower of Christ, everything's supposed to be great, right? You shouldn't have mental health problems. Just think on what's lovely and you'll never struggle with bipolar. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm, great. Mm -hmm. You know, I, our family, we have a ton of people, it seems like, diagnosed with ADHD. And uh, my, my younger son actually just got diagnosed with that today. Mm -hmm. um, he, well, not my youngest son. Uh, he is Eli. A lot of you know Eli, but he is mm -hmm. six years old, first grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when I tell you this kid bounces off the walls, I mean, he is like <laughs> literally uh, uh, just go nonstop, like just doesn't matter what he does. There's no like, oh, he's going to crash and come down from that. He's going all day. No, he just mm. he has hyperactivity. And, you know, I'm I'm thrilled that there's people out there that uh, can not only kind of help him with some coping mechanisms and some things to say, hey, maybe this will calm you down, but also that there's medical treatment to say, hey, mm -hmm. maybe this will help. You know, maybe it's dietary, maybe it's it's straight up mm -hmm. medicine of mm -hmm. some sort or whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. there's no shame in that, and mm -hmm. uh, we can we can choose to embrace shame, or we can, you know, one of the things I like to say at Men of Valor is I refuse to choose shame. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to choose shame just because it's more convenient for you and you don't want to get messy with something so mm -hmm. i'm not embarrassed that my son has adhd i'm not embarrassed mm -hmm. that i had uh you know family members as you said even with with bipolar or schizophrenia or, or whatever mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. diagnosis may be it's it's part of the broken world in which we live in and mm -hmm. i'm not going to hide from that any more than i'm going to hide from the fact that we serve a beautiful savior that if he chooses to he can heal and if not mm -hmm. Uh, he can always choose to point us in the right direction with a good doctor and mm -hmm. uh, a good friend. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that and being vulnerable. That's, that's good. And, and I wish more leaders in Christian ministry would say, you know what, it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. Um, and it's okay to get help. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things I love about you guys and, and get your take next, Nathan, but 
Um, obviously, I, I know your your boss, Mark, uh, lead pastor at Hope Fellowship very well. Uh, dear friend, um, one of very, very, very small number, I could probably count one hand pastors that I just admire, uh, that I um, just think has humility and really has a heart for, for people and wants people to know the gospel. So I, I know Mark well, and I also know how involved he loves to be with his staff and that uh, he's he wants to know what you're doing and, and what's going on and how you're working and everything. So what is it what is it like as far as and, and you can be thinking of this, Matthew, but I also want to hear what you have to say, Nathan, about experience with mental health. But I know Mark does a great job of just making sure you guys, you know, are balanced and not just yeah, I have no idea what Nathan's doing and he's burning out and there's no candle left. He's out to the bottom of the wick or whatever. That's a beautiful thing to be in ministry and be able to talk about, hey, this is where I'm at and I'm getting fried here or um, I, I need a different track or I need a break or, or whatever. Um, you don't get that a lot, quite honestly. You really, really don't find that in a lot of places. But what do you think... Uh, Nathan, as far as experiences, I mean, obviously you mentioned growing up in a home, what a privilege that is to have a dad to not only work in that area, but, um, you know, I've been privileged to meet him before and you and I've had multiple conversations in the past and just great guy. And I know how much his example and everything's meant to you. So I'm sure you've probably seen many that you could draw on over the years, but anything come to mind immediately? No, I mean, I, I think honestly, just tagging off of Matthew and even what you said, I really do think what I've, what I've found for myself, and I, I can't speak towards the, towards a lot of it, but I think as far as it goes of the anxiety and depression, probably maybe your more common ones that maybe more people would empathize with or go, yeah, that's probably me. I, I think what I have found with at least a lot of the college students that we, that I work with is that nothing gets it doesn't get per se solved but it gets a lot better when they have those close proximity one to three people who are bearing their who are actually bearing those burdens i think that text is such a powerful you know to bear one another's burdens is to be let in on this is all of me this is me honestly as i am right now holding nothing back mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's how we're supposed to be with god and oftentimes we aren't even that with god uh, but being able to do that with a physical person who we can see, who can respond to us, who can be a listening ear, who can just ask a question back. Uh, I've found that a lot of the people's um, depression, anxiety, those things are just increased by isolation. Uh, hence why COVID sparked all this, you know, or, or I really do think even just the, the, the false propaganda within the church that says, you know, you can't, you can't, you got to hide this. This isn't something you can say publicly as far as mental health goes. It's just a work of Satan in the sense that he's just oh, trying God. to get everyone to curve inwards, isolate themselves and not talk about these things because he knows that the more we talk about them, uh, James five, confess your sins to one another and it will be healing to your flesh. I mean, I think a lot of times, I think the things that I see causing, and this is maybe just to a unique 18 to 25 year old range, but what causes them the most anxiety or depression is what you said, Travis, is shame over something sinful that they did in the past, that they're way past that God has mm -hmm. saved and sanctified them from, but Satan's just got like a shame hold on them in some way, shape or form. Um, and so for them, it's just driving them down a deeper rut of depression or anxiety or fill in the blank type thing. And so I think that's been a big uh, proponent for me is just, can we find these people? Do you, do you have close relationships? Um, you know, I, my freshman year in college, nothing, I would not say severe, severe, I would say just intense numbness. All my freshman year of college was just, uh, I had moved away, made some last minute decisions, good decisions because I had gotten saved and Jesus had really become real to me over that summer. And um, that whole freshman year though of college, I just didn't know anyone. And I, I just remember I would lay and I was living with my sister and her husband, not an ideal situation, but it was cheaper that way. And I remember just laying, staring um, at the ceiling for six, eight hours at a time and just not realizing that six or eight hours had passed by just because of how numb I felt. Um, and it wasn't sadness. It wasn't, you know, it could be, it could have been depression. Sure. It, it was just numb. 
And uh, I felt that way yep. for most of my freshman year until I met my best friend, Zane, who's a pastor out in Nebraska now. And he became just that that close brother, that bearer of burdens, that person who he started to recognize, hey, you're acting differently. And all of a sudden we were having a conversation and it was all, it felt at times like he was pulling me out of something that I was headed towards if I didn't have him. Um, same thing now with my wife, Cassie. She knows me well. She knows all of me, all the bad parts, all the good parts. Uh, but that allows her to have a voice in my life that nobody else really gets to have. And a, a knowing of me that helps me whenever I am starting to go down those uh, I'm preaching this Sunday. I'm sick. I haven't get, been, I didn't, wasn't able to work on my sermon today. I was starting to panic tonight, right before we got on this call. And Cassie looked at me and said, you've prepped a sermon with shorter time and it's been fine. So it's just those moments where it, if I didn't have those people around me, yeah. I, I would just continue to spiral. But because I have those people in my life that can speak truth, can speak honestly, can hold me accountable, can convict me, can pull me out of a rut, can bear my burdens when I'm too depressed or too numb to even feel anything. You know, I think that's one of the most essential things, along with getting the help, finding a great counselor. I, I think a Christian counselor is probably ideal. Maybe we can differ on that. But uh, for me, I'm always, I would love to always have opinions from a Christian counselor, someone sure. who knows scripture, but also knows the science of the body and the mind and can pair those two things together. Um, for me, I, I, I want somebody who knows where my hope is found, where my joy is found, yeah. um, all those things. Um, but again, I think that's a blessing in my own life. And Matthew can speak to this too, but even your question about Mark, um, and the type of leader that he is, it, he doesn't ask us to hold it in or keep it quiet. He's pretty much like, if you have a problem or if you need something, come into my office, my door, my phone is always open. And, uh, I know I can speak for myself. I've gone to him many times saying, I need a day. I need a couple days. Um, I just remember a time when it wasn't even me. It was my wife. Um, and she would not mind me sharing this, but she was just bogged down with school and she was coaching basketball and she was just overwhelmed and in a massive rut. And I just came to Mark and said, I need to miss a Sunday because uh, she is doing not well right now. And as a husband, I need to love her well by asking you this. And I need to go down and we met her parents halfway at the beach and just spent three days sitting on a beach, hanging out with her parents, playing games. And it was just what she needed for her own mental yeah. health. It wasn't even for me. And it was missing a Sunday. And that's, you know, it's one thing to miss a Tuesday. It's another thing to miss a Sunday in church world and a pastor's world. <laughs> and Mark, without hesitation, was yeah. absolutely go. So I think that's the, I mean, that's huge. And that's Mark's own experiences. If he was on here, he would say that's his 40 something years of ministry has led him to be able to function like this and want to function like this as a leader. Um, yeah. Because, you know, Travis, he probably had more of your background where it was keep it in, don't tell anyone it's a weakness if you do type thing. So uh, but I don't know if you have different experiences, but Mark for me is, ooh. is a saint. Uh, just yes. because he really is. If you need a day, take a day type thing. You're and both. A lot yeah. of times I asked. I was going to say, you're both, uh, you know it already, but extremely blessed to, to serve under him and, I told my wife today, I said, you know, there's two, uh, we're talking about why pastors can be so territorial and so aggressive sometimes and, and all these different things. And I said, there's, there's two pastors and Mark was one of them, but another one named Vic Ransom, a guy I served under in Virginia that I know of personally that just were humble and, and you could go to, and they really did care about people and you could say things to, and it's, it's rare to find that, but I, I love, I want to get back to what you said, James 5, uh, 16, confess your sins to one another and, and you'll find healing. That is such a beautiful thing. And I, it's not ironically, it's a God thing you brought that up. I've had three different conversations today around James 5, 16. Uh, it's something uh, my, uh, I call him, you know, my, my spiritual mentor. He's like a, uh, an older brother to me, um, the guy I did the podcast the first of this month on as far as caring for your soul. Uh, we do soul care with one another every week for two hours, you know, face to face on on a Monday. And then we check in throughout the days, throughout the week. But we've been talking a lot of this idea and this factor so much into mental health. And you touched on it as far as having people you can talk to. There's so much into the idea of confess your sins to one another. Uh, on both sides of that, there's a willingness to open up and let someone into some deep places, but there's also a willingness on the other side of that conversation to receive someone's confession, to hear it, 
and act as a lowercase priest under Jesus's authority and, and not necessarily forgive their sins, but to listen to the things that are burdening them and say, hey, there's hope. Like you said, there's hope anchored to Christ. There's forgiveness. There's healing. What are you dwelling on? What would Christ say to that? What would Christ want you to hear and to speak into that for one another? Um, I think that's something the American church could definitely, definitely improve and grow in that, that we lack tremendous, um, just tremendous, any kind of effort in, you know, I just don't see a lot of brothers going around saying, Hey, I need 30 minutes of your time today. I have some confession. There's some sin in my life. There's some things I just need to get off my yeah. conscience and have that other person receive it in such a way that you actually walk away saying, wow, I feel healed. Like James talks about, right? I feel not just lighter, but I feel a rebirth taking place in my heart. And I think the Holy spirit does that through us as believers to one another. It's a, it's a whole beautiful conversation for another podcast, but I can't believe how quick time's going. I really have like 10 minutes left and I need to wrap this up. It's crazy. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt, jump I in. Wanted, I just want to say something real quick about that, James, fine, the healing and everything there. And I just think, it's, I can't, I think we, can't, we can't gloss over that because that does connect to our mental health, right? And, you know, yeah. our, when we're holding on to these unconfessed sins, when we are feeling isolated, when that is that eats away at the peace and the joy and the life yeah. that, that God yeah. calls us to. And so, and so it is so critical. And I just, one thing, another thing is like for the, some of the guys that are, are listening, don't expect somebody to come into your life and be that person for you. Right. We should be a part of flipping the script as far as the, as the local church to where it should be natural for older men to be reaching out and pouring into younger men with the intention to to be that uh, safe place for them in a disciple making culture but the reality is that's not for many churches for many people that's not the case so i would just challenge uh those you're, you're listening the men that are listening you go seek out you seek out that yeah. person that you know that you can trust that has that shown himself to be you know faithful trustworthy somebody you look up to you seek them out and invite them into your space and say, "Hey, I I need this." Um, so good. don't wait. Don't don't wait for you know them just to come come run into you. Like you gotta you got to you, you seek them out. That's good. Amen. Amen to that. I mean, Paul told them right. Paul, Paul told Timothy, "Let no man despise your youth." Right. It, Age is a number from God's perspective. It's like time. God God doesn't operate the way we do. And so uh, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, uh, like you said, Matt, seek out that guy. Um, whether you're uh, willing to be that for someone else or you're needing that too, take take the initiative. Don't, don't shy mm -hmm. away from it. I love it. I'm, I'm going to throw something out for you guys to just ponder that I want to end the podcast on and we'll get to it in just a minute. But I want to talk, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, managing our mental health, uh, well, that how that factors in, in regards to the gospel, what, what's the tie in there? Why does it matter, uh, in relation to gospel? Because I know for us as a ministry, I know for you guys personally, as well as in your ministries, it's all about the gospel. Uh, and I always want to make sure we're tying whatever we're talking about into the gospel because the gospel touches on everything, including mental health. So just kind of tuck that in the back of your mind, if you can, and think about it for a second, as far as how this aspect is connected or why it's a factor when it comes to the gospel. But I want to, before we get to that, just talk a little bit real quick for five or six minutes here about some of the stigmas or some of the things that keep us from discussing mental health, because sometimes even just recognizing some of those barriers is a way of beginning to remove the barriers. Um, just a couple of thoughts. I wrote down, open it up to you guys and see if there's any any additional barriers you can think of. I thought of, well, just one, the stigma of it in and of itself uh, is, is huge, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. But also, I think uh, sometimes uh, misinterpreting our faith or it's a misinterpretation of our faith that somehow if you have faith, you shouldn't have any kind of mental struggles. And if you do, it's because you're lacking faith kind of thing. Um I wrote down tr traditional gender roles. Um, I, I kind of don't like using that language a lot just because how culture uses it. But the reality that, you know, 
men aren't supposed to be weak. And so we have a hard time admitting, you know, mm -hmm. that maybe we're struggling mentally or having a mm -hmm. hard time talking about what we're feeling or expressing. Um, I wrote a lack of awareness. Uh, I think sometimes uh, you guys have both kind of touched on it. You can just kind of get into a phase and, you know, maybe it's not quite depression, but it feels heavy. It feels weighty. And, and you may not even know it sometimes because you're just mm -hmm. go, go, go. Um, last thing I wrote, and then I don't want to take every, every answer, so to speak. The last thing I wrote down was uh, just this pressure to conform. I think it's uh, a real a barrier to people not wanting to talk about mental health it's well everyone else is doing it and not complaining and everybody or everybody else seems to be uh doing it without having any you know barriers or whatnot so it's just me and and i want to get along and i i want to make sure i'm not rocking the boat and i don't want to be the person that stands up and says hey you know whatever and so um there's this pressure that i've got to kind of either keep it to myself so everything keeps operating copacetic like or uh, maybe the norm in the Christian community you're a part of is the, their norm might be they don't validate mental health. And so you just want to, you know, not not ruffle the, the feathers or stir the water. So you just kind of go along to get along. And that can be a real barrier to addressing maybe something real, real heavy internally going on. So any additional barriers you guys can think of or any maybe thoughts in addition to what I already shared that you just want to piggyback on some of those barriers, but anything come to mind, I'll, I'll just throw it out. And either one of you can jump in if you want. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, two really quick ones, I think, and, and probably one of them is maybe similar to what you just said, Travis, but I'd say the first one is thinking that we can just handle it by ourselves and then don't, we don't have to burden anyone else with it. So I think too, that's the other thing with men as insecure beings and prideful beings, which those two go in tandem with one another, that we don't want to put that on anyone else. And so a lot of times I know for myself, I'll go, well, I can just, if I can just get through this, I don't have to bother my wife. I don't have to bother Cass with this. You know, I don't have to bother so-and-so with this. I'll just get through this on my, on my own, put my head down in two weeks. I'll be fine. No one will know the difference. In those two weeks, I was a terrible person and, you know, everyone noticed. And, you know, so it's like, <laughs> did not do a great job. Yeah. And in fact, I burdened more people by saying, I'm not going to burden yeah. anyone. So that's a big one. And then I think comparison to the wrong people, I think, uh, and maybe it can be in tandem with uh, not a sound biblical understanding of the people in scripture. I, I mean, it, I, I feel like the more I have read the Psalms, the more I feel fine about how I feel, uh, the more I even just read the gospels and just see how Jesus functioned on a day-to-day -day basis, how Jesus wept publicly over things that burdened his heart or broke his heart, how Jesus, just how these men of God who Jesus, obviously, but even David, a man after God's own heart, the manliest man, like murdered so many, the dude is a baller in so many different ways, more than one. Uh, and has a bad side to himself as well. But, you know, all these things, but then he is the writer of all of these things where it's, my heart is crying out, you know, my yeah. soul is breaking. So I think for me, the more I've compared myself to Jesus or the more I've started to go c compare, what, what what am I feeling? Is this valid? Is this okay? Should I be keeping the secret? Should I be putting this out there for God to see or for somebody else to see? Oftentimes in the past, I've compared myself to other people and go, well, they're not doing it. Uh, so I'm not going to do it. And now as I feel like I've started to become more rooted in the word and picked up that routine now over the years of just meditating on the word as often and as frequently as possible. Now I feel myself comparing myself to those characters in scripture to where I feel way more comfortable because I'm comparing myself to the right people mm. to say, I can express myself in this way like what you said about gender roles i mean i i had three older sisters so i think i was just brought up to feel a lot more than maybe other guys uh and so you know maybe i'm more of a quote unquote baby as my brother-in-laws all call me sometimes and i accept that and i'm secure enough in my manhood to to let them call me that if they want me to uh but i think it's just now it's this is just how god has wired me this is how my parents raised me this is the environment that i got raised in and so for me with all of these things with mental health as well it's just 
I can feel these things and I can bring these things out into the light because that's where healing happens is in the light. So I think those two of comparison to the wrong people makes me shut down and then making me think I just I got to protect people around me. So I'm just going to do this by myself, carry this burden alone and get through it. Yeah. So that I don't like someone, I think those two are some of the biggest Good barriers. stuff. Good stuff. Matthew, you want yeah. to tag on or what do you think? Yeah, just real quick. I, I just think that all what you guys said is is so good. Um, and Travis said you just laid out all of these 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 barriers. And I just think it's pretty simply for me, what it boils down to is that, you know it's it's a a, a a pride you know is a barrier. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. I don't want to I don't want to look weak. Yeah. I don't I don't I, I don't want to I don't want to depend on anything. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so that's 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 what it is. That's good. That's real good. And one, I, the irony of how the enemy works, you know, you don't want to look weak, but yet one of the, the strongest things you can do is to ask for help. The strongest thing you can do is to be bold enough to speak truth to someone and, and, and say something. So uh, we're going to end it by talking about how the gospel ties in. I have my own thought that, that I would share, but I don't want to steal the thunder. I feel like I've been doing that this whole podcast. So <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, we'll let you lead off this time, Matthew. I, I know how near and dear to your heart discipleship is the gospel is how important it is to to your whole being as, as it is to nathan's i'm not trying to say nathan doesn't care about the gospel so much. less than matthew less than matthew <laughs> a little bit lower on the bar right but maddie we'll, we'll start with you what what's the tie-in as far as why why should i care as much about my mental health as it relates to the gospel what do you got yeah i mean it's going back to romans 12 you know it's our whole bodies. Um, that's being presented to the Lord as a living sacrifice. That body represents our mind, will, emotions, our, our physical capability. Um, and when we are feeling attacked or debilitated or restricted in our in our minds, we're going to be less likely to want to share the good news of the gospel. We're going to feel shameful about even how we feel. So we, how can I share the gospel if I'm wrestling with depression or I'm wrestling with anxiety? Um, the enemy, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. His, his, his goal, right? And we know the battlefield is in the mind. It begins with the mind first. So, he, of course, there's going to be this attack on our mental health. And so, if we are, you know, to love other people, how how am I going to love other people when I'm wrestling with even loving myself? Or how am I going to love God when I feel so distant from him and my mental depression just feels so disconnected to to a loving personal God and so if I'm not feeling loved by God if I'm not able to love other others because I'm so de debilitated then it cuts us off right the heart of the, of, yep. of the gospel you know and being uh disciples who make disciples so that's 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 why it's so important I think Good and, deal. Uh, to me yeah that's good. Uh, what about you, Nathan? What are, what are your thoughts? For some reason, Philippians 2 came to my mind. Of uh, Philippians 2.12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And just this idea that what the gospel brings, as we are justified in Christ completely and his sacrifice is sufficient for all, the thing that comes next is we get to enter into this uh, kingdom work where we are ushering in light to dark places, being salt of the earth, like what Matthew is saying and discipling those to make disciples. Okay. But I think it's really hard to do that if we are still feeding on milk for the rest of our lives. We're not going to be fulfilling the call that Christ has given to us and enabled in us and empowered us to by the sacrifice and by the blood of Christ, if we are uh, not taking taking care of ourselves, maybe I don't like that language because that's maybe more worldly language, but more so working out our salvation with fear and trembling. If we are not creating spaces to encounter the presence of God and to be transformed by his presence, then we're going to be uh, almost more a part of the problem than the solution in the sense of we're, we're going to be unable to join the spirit in the work of ushering in the kingdom of God to the kingdom of darkness. And I think that's, that's the big thing that I, and, and Matthew's big on this in his new position in the discipleship pastor at Hope, which is why we're, we're so excited that he's in that position is because we do feel like 
salvation in its first form justification has been so that's been the main focus that our sanctification that comes through discipleship and comes through experiencing more of God has kind of gotten almost forgotten to the point that we're not realizing the fact that the gospel is not one moment, but it is an, an eternity now of justification and sanctification and glorification that the gospel is not just a, a part of our life. It's not just a, it's not the thing that just starts us off. It is the thing that sustains us. And so if we're not one meditating frequently on the gospel, if we're not one reminding ourselves of the sacrifice of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, and if that's not rooted in us, and if that's not set before us, then I don't think we're going to be able to fulfill the call that Christ has placed over us. And I think as far as mental health goes, I think, again, it, would come, it talks about work out our salvation, working out our whole salvation means to be working on becoming like Christ in every aspect, yeah. mind, body, and spirit, not just one spirit aspect. Mm. So I think that's, that's the big, I mean, there are probably so many ways. And I think Matthew hit the yeah. nail on the head. So. Both, both great, great examples. I'll just throw mine out there for kicks and giggles since I, I said I had a thought. Uh, I, I went right back to the beginning of Genesis, you know, 225. Uh, we have this perfected setting described, the man and, and the woman both naked and unashamed. I, that was so important. God put that verse in there because it describes a world where there's absolute freedom, absolute perfection, um, it's free of all guilt, uh, you know, blowing it, shame, all that kind of stuff. And all the enemy, after being defeated by God, all he had left was to try and defeat God's creation, right? And so we know the story in the fall, and um, he gets man, man to fall, and, and God shows up in Genesis 3.10 looking for that relationship, and man is where? Man is hiding, and God calls him, he comes out such a beautiful picture of the gospel you know god knowing where we are yet he still calls seeking us uh first and foremost and man comes out embarrassed uh probably i imagine adam's head was hanging pretty low uh probably even covering the energy you know, the, the leaves he put over himself knowing they were insufficient and i just love the verbiage there in 310 where um you know god says <clears throat> you know who told you you were naked? You know, who told you? And it, it's that reality that there's an enemy constantly telling us where we're broken, where we're incomplete, tapping in, as you said, Matthew, as well, John 10, 10, just doing all he can to destroy our minds, destroy our, our purpose, destroy our souls, even if, if possible. And, um, so thankful the gospel message is that God didn't leave us in that place. God never intended us to stay in the shadows of shame and to stay hidden and to stay broken. He calls us out of that. And he does that first and foremost through the cross, through redemption. I love how you you describe it there as well, Nathan, that it's an ongoing sanctification. It's an ongoing working out of our salvation. And he's given us beautiful things to do that with, right? The body of Christ. Uh, one another. He's given us the word of God. He's given us the Holy Spirit. And in those three, we have all that we need. Um, and so my my prayer, my plea for anybody listening is that you would lean into those three. You would find a body of believers. You would find, even if it's just two or three good brothers, as we've talked about, you could, you could lean into. You would go to the Lord through scripture, and you would also uh, seek the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, and, and the Father, our, our Abba, through prayer and allow him to reveal and to work and to guide and direct and do some of these things. Uh, guys, I can't thank you enough. Uh, Nathan, Matthew, as I said, two dear friends, um, just love seeing you guys on a more regular basis. Now that, uh, newsflash, my wife and I have back around attending and, uh, want to encourage you if you're curious what these guys look like, want to know more about, uh, the church, uh, hope and Anderson, right. Hope and Anderson.com. I think I got that right. Hope and Anderson.com. <laughs> And uh, just a bunch of people that that are loving Jesus and trying to encourage other people to do the same and, and make our, our dark world a little bit brighter. So thank you, men, for joining us. Thank you for taking time away from your families, your children, your own health and well-being by not resting and getting on a podcast with me. Um, really appreciate that. Just real quick, and we'll uh, close this, this episode out. I want to remind you guys of our annual conference in August. We're 
expecting uh, 350 or more men to show up this year based on our pre-registrations and everything else. So we're really excited about that. It's going to be in outside Asheville, North Carolina. And I uh, want to encourage you to go on, sign up online. Registrations are still very, very cheap and very low, very reasonable. Uh, it, more than anything, though, if you need community, you can go to our website, movministries.org, movministries.org. You can find a lot of resources there to encourage you, uh, to plug you into community. We have an online community through the band app where you can get connected to other brothers. You can share prayer requests. You can ask questions about this podcast or other topics we've covered um, there's all kinds of things uh, that we try and throw at you to just give you many options at growing in your faith. Uh, lastly, want to remind you that on Monday mornings, if you're keen to getting up early, 530, we do a live Zoom call, live teaching. We have teachers that rotate just a way to start our week off. We call it Man Up Monday. So 530 on Mondays, if you're interested, you can find that information as well on our website. Again, thank you guys so much for joining us, uh, Nathan, Matthew. It's such a privilege to have you guys. And uh, I just pray that whoever's listening to this, uh, if you're struggling, that you'll find uh, the healing, you'll find the peace, and you'll find um, the man, the Savior, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, uh, first and foremost, through all of our conversations we've had tonight. So love all of you. God bless. And as our leader always tells us, go light it up for the King. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode and that you will continue to join us on this journey to make disciples of men. Be sure to check out our social media outlets as well as movministries.org for any information and be sure to join our digital men's community. Hey guys, we wanted to let you know that Men of Valor podcast is proud to partner and be a part of the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast network you can find their podcast and many other great podcasts by going to rfpnetwork.org we would love for you to go and check them out as well hey keep fighting win today and as always go light it up for the king